try something different in this YouTube channel. You know, I've got a blog on BehindBalanceSheet.com and I've done um, a couple of articles, long articles on Greensill and a few smaller articles in our club site. And I thought, well, why don't we try and do a video blog? So this is it. If you want to read more of any of this, you can go to the website behind and, and and read the article. But let me run through it in a video and see how we get on. So what we did, and we've done this in a video before, was we looked at the 10 largest positions in the principal Credit Suisse supply chain fund. Now, you know, there's several of these funds and this particular one had, I think, $6.8 billion of assets as of January 2021, which is the last time we've got details. Credit Suisse has withdrawn all the, the top 10, so you can't get access to them as of March when um, green sales started to implode. But these are the top 10. And originally we went through it quite quickly and some of the, some of the companies we knew and some of the companies we didn't know but we've spent quite a bit of time doing some additional work and I want to share with you what we found because many of these um, transactions look slightly weird. You know, none of them are arm's length legitimate transactions done in the ordinary course of business as a supply chain finance fund. And that seems to me something that people should have picked up on earlier. So let me just go through what I found. So the first one is MSC and the connection here is that the former finance director, Sebastian Wittgenstein, the former MSC finance director in Geneva, moved to Greensill. I don't know whether Greensill had a Geneva office before, but they certainly had one when he joined. Now, originally I looked at this and I said, well, MSC is a massive private shipping company, so it's not inconceivable that they would use supply chain finance because guess what? It's probably an extra avenue for them to finance themselves. And although it was, you know, a significant volume, um, when we look back, it was $320 million. MSC is a big company. So, you know, it was understandable, but that looks like there's been a, a connection. So it's clearly not an arm's length transaction. And if you remember, um, if you look back to the original blog that I did with Mark Rubenstein, Mark spotted that Vodafone's treasurer had moved to become the CFO at Greensill. And if you remember, we were puzzled because there wasn't, there wasn't a logical reason why Vodafone would have been using the supply chain finance fund and then investing in it. Because if it had the cash, why would it use supply chain finance? Didn't make any sense. Unless it was just trying to flatter its balance sheet, I suppose. But it, 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 it looked a very odd transaction. And here's Neil Garrod. You can see Vodafone Group Treasury Director moved to be the CFO of Greensill full time and is now the finance lead of the company in administration. So um, there was clearly a connection there and there's clearly a connection with MSC. The second one is View Inc. Now, um, when I looked at this before, I, I wasn't that familiar with View Inc, but it turns out that View Inc now has a quote and so we can get access to some of its um, financial data. And the loan was 275 million and the company only had $24 million of revenue in 2019. Now, forgive me, but that just looks, it's not possible that this could be supply chain finance because how could it be using 275 million of suppliers? I mean, it is barely possible if you think that it was doing, it was building a factory and it hadn't, it had only just started. I mean, it is barely possible. But the key thing is that Viewing was invested in by SoftBank. 
and that's the connection and in each of these we're going to see a connection now you remember that um, last time I did this I talked about BCC Bingera and Ferry Mead and both of these are mills or towns in the Bundaberg area which is where Lex Greensill comes from and we didn't know what BCC Bing Bingera and Ferry Mead actually represented but some very good work by Robert Smith at the Financial Times um, he did a, a lot more digging than I've done and he said that Bingera was actually a codename for Katera. So both Bingera and Ferrymead, there were some multi-obligor notes with those names on them. And Katera is a bust trans construction company. It constructed modular housing, which was going to be the next big thing. And of course it was invested in by SoftBank. And SoftBank actually lent Greensill or funded Greensill with an additional $400 million to cover the losses at Katera. But Greensill clearly didn't cover all of that within the Credit Suisse fund. So this was a very odd situation. And number 10 in the top 10 list was BCC Ferrymead. And apparently this represented a multi obligor note, which is entirely one obligor, which is Bluestone Resources, the resource company which sued Greensill in the United States. The UK. Now, Oyo is a famous Indian hotel group whose founder, Ritesh Agarwal, borrowed $2 billion to increase his stake in his own company at the same price that SoftBank injected its capital. Now, who lent him $2 billion to invest in this? I've got no idea, but I suspect that they might struggle to get their money back. Anyway, the Oil Hospitality UK, um, this business now has 80 hotels and two and a half thousand rooms. It's got sales in its last um, filed accounts of under a hundred thousand pounds. It had 350 million of share capital injected and a $200 million loan. I mean, it's inconceivable this could have been trade finance. Obviously, again, it's a soft bank investee. Again, it doesn't look to have been an arm's length transaction. And interestingly, I mean, when I first did this, I, I couldn't find any um, information about the UK business, but now I've done a bit more work. I mean, 80 hotels and 2,500 rooms doesn't seem like much because in fact, oil was guaranteeing a minimum amount of revenue for people that came on its system. So I don't know the exact details of what they promised in the UK, um, but you can imagine that any minimum revenue guarantee would be snapped up in the COVID environment by any hotel group. And this is the, one of the oil hotels in, this one's in Golders Green. Um, I've forgotten whether it was 27 pounds or 42 pounds a night when I did the original piece of research. And then I looked for some more. This is one in SW1. This was actually, I mean, very cheap for the, for the location, SW1. This is one of their flagship hotels. It was under 50 pounds a night or 60 pounds a night. And um, it just doesn't seem like an obvious recipient of a $200 million loan. And it certainly couldn't have been the recipient of $200 million of trade finance. I mean, just cannot imagine how that would be possible. Um, let's move on to number five, Shop Direct, and number eight, PrimeVear, because PrimeVear's shareholders, the, the shareholders in Shop Direct as well. And these are the Barclay brothers. I mean, one of them sadly died. But um, what we found out was that um, the prime veer debt is actually a mortgage. It was revealed in the, in the, I think, in the Times. And so it's very clear that the shop direct transaction isn't arm's length. I said in the original piece that the you know, prime veer was a logistics warehouse. It wasn't large enough to have that size of supply chain finance. It just wasn't turning over enough money. And we've subsequently found out, well, indeed it wasn't and it was a mortgage. Number six, now this is where it starts to get a bit more interesting because 
I hadn't time to do very much work on trade shift holdings and I couldn't find out too much about it, but I've subsequently done a bit more. And if this is its website, um, the trade shift story. So three Danes walk into a garage and they talk about 95% of businesses in Denmark using trade shift, which of course is absolute nonsense because not every business would be able to use um, supply chain finance supply chain software, which is what TradeShift says it does. It seems to me that it also does finance because when you look at its balance sheet, this is the balance sheet of the UK company, the last filed set of accounts, you can see that it's got very large amounts of debtors and very large amounts of creditors, which are out of scale relative to its P&L and relative to the 10 or 15 million pounds that it's been turning over. And what's particularly interesting about TradeShift Network Limited, the UK subsidiary, is that um, it hasn't been, hasn't filed accounts. But the, my, my problem with TradeShift, and I think this is something that warrants some further work, the, the founder's cult, the personality that is being presented looks slightly odd and this bro sort of image for a B2B operation. They claim that they represent 95% of Danish businesses, which is, is nonsense. I mean, I can't imagine how that would possibly be true because a large chunk of businesses wouldn't want or need supply chain help. Um, and they did a fundraising in 2018. And after the fundraising, they announced that what they were going to do is they were going to cut staff and reduce costs. Very unusual. You know, normally when you raise new equity, it's to grow your business, not to shrink it. But the, the real um, issue for me is that they haven't filed UK subsidiary accounts and they were in danger of being struck off. And the UK subsidiary was in danger of being struck off com company's house. And the auditor refused to give an opinion because he said that they'd failed to keep proper accounting records. Now, you know, this is a business with 10 million pounds plus of turnover. I mean, how can you not keep proper accounting records? It's extraordinary. And you would have thought that Greensill would have been reluctant to lend to a company whose subsidiary didn't keep proper accounting records. Um, and it seems particularly odd to me because although TradeShift doesn't say that it's doing supply chain finance, its balance sheet looks like it's doing supply chain finance. And if it is doing supply chain finance, why would it be financing itself using a supply chain finance fund? It's, almost impossible to see how that would make any sense because it would be a hugely expensive source of finance for it. So it just doesn't make any sense, this transaction and this appearance in the top 10 list. Number seven is quasi, I don't even know how to pronounce it, but it's part of a group that is a, a, an automotive retailer, new and used cars, and again, backed by SoftBank. But look, they did a, a $1.5 billion fundraise in February 19 and another $200 million in May 20. And they claim to be profitable in Q4 19. So the question there is, okay, I mean, it could conceivably be a legitimate trade finance, but why would it need the cash? You know, it's just raised $1.7 billion. Why would it need $100 million extra in supply chain finance? I don't, I, I just don't understand. Number eight, we covered number nine, Deutsche Börse, where one of the journalists very cleverly discovered that this was apparently a loan to General Atlantic, um, one, of, one of the original backers of Greensill. I mean, if it's not that, it's unclear why Deutsche Börse would need this money, and it certainly wouldn't be in the ordinary course of business. So we've covered all 10 of the top 10. Every single one of them, without exception, has some oddity about it. Even a cursory examination by Credit Suisse would have exposed this. And I don't understand what's gone on here, but it looks, all looks, very, very odd. So that's it. We know that green sales failed, but I think one of the most important things to do when you have a failure like this is to try and learn some lessons. And certainly 
one of the things that you always should do if you're investing in a fund is to look at the sectoral exposures, the geographical exposures, and if they give you a disclosure of the top 10 positions, you should look at them and make sure that you're comfortable. And in the case of Greensill, even a very cursory examination would have made you ask questions. And if you looked at it in more detail, you would have run a mile and wouldn't have invested. So I hope that was useful. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching.